So, today we're going to be taking a look at the holdings of the, I believe, the largest hedge fund in the U.S., and that is Bridgewater, uh, which is Ray Dalio's hedge fund. You guys may have heard of him. Um, founded in 1975 by Ray Dalio, uh, over $140 billion in assets under management. That is colossal. Uh, looks like it was 160 at one point. So, I was thinking it'd be fun to go through kind of like their portfolio because I think they, uh, hedge funds typically have a lot different, a lot different of a take on the overall market conditions. Uh, and they also take more of a stance towards preservation of wealth uh, versus ultimate growth. Uh, and that's why sometimes like uh, this, fund, this fund in particular or a segment of it called the, uh, the Pure Alpha Fund, um, it had actually had a positive return of like 9.5% uh, back in 08 during the financial crisis. So hedge funds typically don't perform as well during high growth, you know, years like the past couple we've had, but they do a lot better during the downturn uh, times. So, you know, like your 08-09 financial crisis, the 2018 flash crash, um, this past COVID crash, they did pretty well as well. So... Um, let's get started here. So, you can see here, got about 11.93% of their portfolio in SPY. Um, assuming most of you guys know what SPY is, but that is just the S&P ETF. It is one of the most liquid ETFs in the entire market. Um, I guess similar competitors would be like VU, V-O-O from Vanguard, that's their S&P ETF. Um, not too much to talk about there. Looks like they have um, 1.378. This can't be right. If their fund is $140 billion, how is their only... <laughs> that's weird. I wonder if this chart is broken down into their separate funds. Yeah, it says combined 13F. Okay, ignore that. Um, I wonder what, if it tells us what fund it is. Doesn't look like it. Interesting. Okay, but SPY, obviously a big folding. Um, Ray Dalio is a big proponent of diversification. So, uh, granted, we know this is not just one fund, but across all of his hedge funds within Bridgewater, there are 600 holdings, which is absolutely nuts. Um, second here, we have VWO. I'm guessing this is some other sort of ETF. Yeah, Emerging Markets ETF. Uh, I've never really gotten too big into the foreign markets, uh, like your world index or your emerging markets or even country-specific indexes. Um, it just kind of uh, irks me a little bit with the lack of regulation in some of these other countries. Um, you know, certain countries rely a lot on things that are kind of run rampant, like mining and uh, oil and sweatshop manufacturing, uh, not necessarily things that, you know, are put under a magnifying glass like companies are in the U.S. Um, that's why you see a lot of contention around Chinese companies right now for their fraudulent accounting. And that's one of the reasons that companies um, like uh, Alibaba, for instance, are trading at discounted valuations um, compared to their peers like, uh, like an Amazon or a Google or something. Um, and that's another reason, uh, if you guys remember Luck and Coffee, I believe it's called, I was never in them, I never really followed it until after it happened, but, um, they were lying, or dis deceitful in, uh, their sales. And that stock ended up imploding, so, 
I don't have the highest respect for foreign markets. Uh, it does round you out a little bit more in terms of diversification. You know, if the U.S. market grabs the bed, a lot of the times we'll see uh, money shift overseas. But my biggest issue is that it's a really flat portfolio most of the time. You can see in the past 10 years, this fund is only up 7.25% with a 1.8% dividend, which is just, you know, it's basically a bond fund at that point. Um, even though it's supposed to be an emerging markets ETF. So I never understood why people held these long. Um, but Ray Dalio has always been a big proponent of that. So it is what it is. Uh, I'm sure you guys know GLD. It's just a gold ETF, gold trust. Uh, so I believe that's physical gold. Uh, Ray Dalio loves his gold. Precious metals. As I said, he's a big fan of diversification. So that's 4.61% of their portfolio. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, obviously. We'll probably just do the first page or two. Uh, next up, we got Walmart, which is actually the biggest company in the U.S. by revenue, I believe, right now. Uh, you would think it would be Amazon or Apple or one of these other companies uh, with a higher valuation, considering that Walmart only has a market cap of like $400 billion. Their margins are just so trash, which is why their valuations are so much lower. Um, you know, not a bad company, honestly. Pretty stable. A uh, big part of their business actually comes from the grocery side of their business, which is interesting. Um, it's it's super stable because I think I remember if the statistics are right, it's like ninety percent of people live within like fifteen miles of a Walmart in the U.S., which is just nuts. Um, but it's pretty stable because of all those locations and because of the repeat business that they get just from like consumer products and grocery. Uh, not sure like long term how much more room they have to grow uh, unless they're gonna go into like new business segments. Um, because with that much coverage in the US already, unless you're really gonna like ramp up market share, which I just don't see happening, um, it's hard to justify. Yeah, you can see people here posting articles uh, holding its own against Amazon, but a little growth and not a bargain. Um, retail giant is stumbling. Walmart is losing, or we're losing faith in Walmart's growth trajectory. So, um, next up, 3.25% uh, of the portfolio is Procter & Gamble. Um, I like Procter & Gamble products. Uh, especially household products. As far as the stock goes, I've never really followed them too closely. Uh, that PE, oh, that's forward PE. I was like, that is way too low. Uh, I've never seen this stock below like a 50 or 60 PE, except maybe during the COVID crash, but even then, uh, it didn't fall that much. Uh, super stable company. Pretty sure they're a dividend aristocrat. Decent yield, uh, decent growth diversification against products. I actually like this company. Uh, if it just wasn't at such a high valuation, I, I would probably buy it. So right now, I think there's probably better places to put your money, but I like that pick. Um, speaking of Alibaba, here it is at 3.22% of his portfolio. Um, as I said, Ray Dalio loves uh, investing across other countries for diversification as well as other sectors so not a surprise that he's in this um, it does trade at a discounted PE uh, I don't like that Seeking Alpha only gives you forward PEs and forward EBS projections makes it kind of hard to value it but Alibaba has had a crazy bang the microphone so I gotta go back and mute that um Next up, we got IEMG. Not sure what this is. Might be another ETF. Yep. Um, just another emerging markets ETF from MSCI. IVV. Core S&P 500 ETF. I'm not really sure what that means. S&P 500 and 
next up, EFA. Uh, I don't even know what this is. The BlackRock Fund, uh, obviously, because it's iShares. I guess large and mid-cap developed market equities. LQD. Investment grade corporate bond. Interesting. I'm a little too young, I think, to really be interested in bonds. I, I just don't think it's worth it at my age. Um, as far as safe investments go, probably one of your best picks. This or something in real estate, REIT space maybe. Or like a solid dividend stock, but this is probably even more preferable than those. You can see what's in the past year here. It's really just bounced around between like 130 bucks and 136. 2.65 percent yield, which is all right. But uh, these are investment grade corporate bonds, so it's not like junk bonds or anything. JD, JD.com. Yep. Don't really know enough about them, but I know it's Chinese. Company appliances, mobile handsets, digital products such as desktop, laptop, and other computers, printer and office equipment, furniture and household. So they're kind of a jack of all trades. Pretty solid revenue growth. They're profitable, which is cool. I'd probably be invested in them if it wasn't a Chinese company. <laughs> Another one of those EAFA, uh, EAFE ETFs. Next up we got MCHI, uh, which is a China ETF. He really likes China. Starbucks. Starbucks is an interesting play uh, because I've seen a lot of people lately comparing them to like a, a bank because of how much money they hold on deposit or not even on deposit, how much money gets loaded onto Starbucks cards, uh, part of which never gets used, and then part of which sits for a long time. And they can actually take the money that's sitting in those accounts uh, because they have a massive amount of uh, transactions that flow in and out of those wallets. There's always like a restanding cash balance of a certain amount across all the card accounts. And uh, because they're not actually a bank, and they're not actually holding people's money. It's more like a credit they're, they're given for like a gift card equivalent. Uh, they're allowed to take that money and do essentially whatever they want with it. So they can invest it. They can use it to grow their business. Uh, they can take out, you know, uh, like bonds or loans against it to other people to try and make money back on that, on that front, uh, which is pretty crazy. Uh, I love Starbucks coffee. I don't know. They've they've closed a lot of stores recently for a variety of reasons. Obviously, it's great stock if you got in a while back. Um, out of the ones we've looked at in this portfolio, this is probably the one I'd be closest to buying. This in like Costco. But I don't know. It takes a lot for me to be uh, to pique my interest. I do. This is also a Chinese company, I believe. Yeah, facing China. I think they're more uh, software based. Yeah, they got a couple apps. Uh, some healthcare, wiki, scholar, social media platform. Probably look at a couple more here and then we'll head off, guys. We've got Estee Lauder. Um, one of the leaders in the makeup industry, as far as I know. I'm not too uh, knowledgeable in the space, so I'm not going to pretend like I am. Uh, but man, that's been some crazy growth. 
So good for him. Surprised they're doing so well during COVID even, uh, which is pretty, pretty crazy. Their forward PE, the forward PE is 53. I can't even imagine what their current PE is, but it's a little crazy. Um, next up we got Abbott Laboratories. I actually own these guys in my dividend portfolio, if any of you guys watched that video. I think it's a healthcare player and solid long-term growth. Uh, doesn't lag too much like J&J tends to do, in my opinion. Um, yield isn't the best. Uh, not sure why that's forward yield and not current yield. Uh, yield isn't the best, but they've got a good dividend growth ratio. If I remember correctly, let's see. Yeah. Last year, they raised it by 19%. Oh, for the past three years, on average, each year, they've raised it by 14%. Uh, for five years out, on average, raised by 10%. So they're kind of accelerating their dividend growth. Um, yeah. One of the few people in the healthcare space that I actually hold, or companies. <laughs> Wow, he actually owns Neo. Um, oh, we're on that dividend page. Not a fan of Neo, honestly. I think it's just a really overvalued Tesla competitor. Don't, don't really follow them enough to uh, to have like a solid opinion on them, but I just think they're they're part of this, you know, EV uh, hype bubble. They have like CCIV, same you know, same sector. Couple more here. It's got Target. Um, don't really know enough about Target. It's pretty crazy growth though. Look at that. They've really ballooned up. I think they've got a little more room to run than Walmart, although they're not quite as, um, much of a household name, I feel like. It looks like they're about a quarter of the valuation of Walmart. It's probably why. Next up, we got DHR, which is Danaher. Not really sure what this company is. Designs, manufactures, and markets professional, medical, industrial, and commercial products and services worldwide. They must be like a machine and instrument company. Mass spectrometry, cellular analysis, lab automation, centrifugation, instruments, microscopes, and genomics consumables. Interesting. All right, guys. We'll call it there. We got down to the positions in this portfolio that are lower than 0.75 of a percent. So, at that point, do they even matter? <laughs> Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you guys have video suggestions or you want me to talk about anything in particular, leave a comment down below, and I'll see you guys next time.